In this video, we're going to specifically focus on how has the site, the Doncaster Plant Work site, been used over time. And we're going to look at the different phases across its entire timeline. And we need to re-emphasize the fact that the history of the Doncaster Plant Works, it is inextricably linked to the wider historical context of British history. So we can almost have the two timelines running alongside each other. We've got British history and we'll see that when uh, the Industrial Revolution is going on and when there are world wars and when there's an industrial decline. That's also mirrored in the Doncaster plant work. So they are directly linked and that's what we mean by inextricably linked. So remember this growth phase, this is when the Doncaster plant works, it grew in size and importance. So let's have a look at the different areas of the plant works uh, itself. So we can see here there's one of the workshops known as the machine shop. Um, you can see here that there's lots of different uh, lots of different types of contraptions here to help the workers to get their complex work done. This is where they would put some of the machines together. Uh, very similar to um, in a similar area, you would see these connecting rods, and these connecting rods they would help to put some of the different um, they would connect the locomotives together. Here we can see this is related to the complex engineering that went on and the me different mechanics. We've got lots of machine work going on here and we can see that it's very, very, um, very complex work. In addition to that, we've explored the social clubs that existed at the time. Here we can see a football club, but we know that there were cricket clubs and boxing clubs, so um, and there were trips to the to the coast. So we know that there was a social and community aspect to the work. The Crimpsall shop was one of the big uh, warehouse factory areas um, and this is where they would repair the locomotives. Remember, a key part, part of um, the plant works um, business was to repair locomotive engines. Here we can see as well that there's actually a sawmill uh, and carpenters worked in this area and they would help to put some of the carriages and maybe repair some of the seating arrangements. And another key aspect of the of the site was always the the erecting shop, and this is where they would actually put together um, the different locomotives. Um, this was an area that was built in 1890, a very expensive um, workshop at the time. But you can see that's where they actually put some of the locomotives together. And then one of the other large areas was the paint shop. This is where they'd obviously paint the different locomotives as they were being repaired and and overhauled. And finally, these are other photos that are really useful to highlight just how busy um, um, the site was. So we've got here the coppersmiths, the boilersmiths and the machine fitters. You can see they're all working together. You can just imagine how noisy and busy the environment will have been. There's another um, angle of the erecting shop and you can see the whole host of workers there. You can see the lots of different workers almost in a big long line there. And then over here, we've got the Crimpsall Repair Shop. Again, to emphasize, their business was about repairing locomotives and overhauling them, essentially taking them um, apart and putting them back together again. And that's another really good photo to show the size and breadth and depth of the work that went on. But moving forward to look at the other work that this site took part in, um, you'll need to remember um, that the Defence of the Realm Act, or we know it as DORA, this enabled the government to take over land or businesses, almost do anything that they wanted in order to support the war effort. And we know that the government took over the Doncaster plant works in order to support the war effort itself. Some important detail here is that remember during this, uh, the beginning of World War One, because of Britain's dominance, it was presumed that it would be over by Christmas. But ultimately the Great War, it lasted longer than anticipated. And as already mentioned, the Doncaster Plant, work, plant Works was used um, under the Defence of the Realm Act to help the war effort. This was, this was in order to help its considerable and large scale production of munitions. This considerable, um, it was a considerable effort that was going on here. And we know that as men left for the army, women had to take over. So as men left, remember this isn't just about women working in the munitions part of the of the site, but it was also about men, women taking over some of the more complex industrial and engineering work. This was really important in the wider historical development of women during the era, but nevertheless we need to emphasise this was about the highly skilled work that women were doing. 
And then moving on, looking at by July 1916, 1,000 shells per week were produced. It started at about 250 per week, but it got to a stage where such was the demand that women were actually producing 1,000 shells per week. And then there's that period in between the world wars. Um, this was an era of the, the, the Flying Scotsman. And essentially, the Doncaster Plant Works became a centre for technological excellence and innovation. This is really important in understanding the significance of that the site played within not just railway development, but within Britain at the time. This was the period and era of well-known engineers like Sir Nigel Gresley and he was the pivotal figure at the forefront of the innovation and technological excellence that surrounded the Flying Scotsman. This was a period where reaching 100 miles per hour was a significant milestone in the development of transport in Britain and therefore the world. And don't forget that London to Edinburgh, the distance that had never been achieved non-stop before, that had never been done. Um, but that's why we have such romanticism um, surrounding this period. Just to recap that, it was the romanticism of first class and the luxury that existed um, in relation to the Flying Scotsman that made it very, very popular. And don't forget it was the excitement of the speed of um, 100 miles an hour um, that made the Flying Scotsman something of an attraction to people. They wanted to ride the train because it was it achieved such a, um, a special milestone. And then also the possibilities of long journeys. London to Edinburgh non-stop. Nothing um, across the world had been achieved like that before. So it got the record speed and it also got the record distance without stopping. We can't forget the also famous, the Mallard train. Because in 1938, it reached the record of 126 miles per hour, smashing the record that the Flying Scotsman had produced. And don't forget, this was all designed and built by Sir Nigel Greasley um, in Doncaster at the plant works itself. Moving on to how the site has been used, we need to focus on World War II. And don't forget, it was also used to support the war effort. Now, the concept of total war was needed again from 1939. Remember when we explored Germany? Germany was slow to industrialise fully to support their war effort. Well, Britain did it in 1939. And it was used under, not DORA, but the Emergency Powers Act. And again, it was a source of considerable large-scale production of munitions. And again, as per World War I, some women, um, some men left for the army, some women had to take over. And as mentioned, that considerable um, war effort was helped by the site, the Doncaster Plant Works site, where they made uh, munitions. They made artillery shells for anti-aircraft guns, um, as highlighted here. They also built um, anti-aircraft guns there. They built anti-warship guns there. Um, and don't forget, they also they also built the horse gliders. And those horse gliders were used during the famous D-Day in 1944, which helped to bring about the, the ending of World War II. This is a photo that highlights some of the other work that went on during the 1950s, 60s and 70s. Essentially, the site became a centre for apprenticeships. It's an, uh, a training school to train up mechanics and engineers and things like that. Um, and this period uh, was a period where the economic and industrial success continued at the site. We can see here some different aspects of the work that continued. So that element of continuity continued basically up until the 1980s. So here we can see more modern trains and the more modern trains that were being overhauled and repaired um, during the 1970s. Here we've got some of the planning that was still going on. Uh, the site was still used for that. As mentioned, we've got apprentices, apprenticeships going on. So the apprentices got trained well um, and we've got some more of the complex engineering going on. But the 1980s, as was the case across Britain during the time, um, experienced an industrial decline where orders and work went down at the plant. So in summary, we need to highlight just how complex it is with regards to how the site has been used over time. And remember, we must emphasise um, how the site is inextricably linked to the wider historical context of British history. 
and we looked at how essentially overhauling and repairing trains was the main business of the site and we've looked at the range of different jobs here's just a few of them we've looked at engineers and boilersmiths coppersmiths and mechanics and designers and the administration team dismantlers and carpenters etc and that was the main part of their business but we also know that by world war one uh, dora meant that the Doncaster plant, work, plant Works was used to support the war, if, war effort. And by July of 1916, the site was actually producing 1,000 munitions a week, which was staggering in order to help the war effort. And the interwar years was the period of the Flying Scotsman and the Mallard, and the site became a centre for technological excellence and innovation, and it became associated with the glamour and romanticism um, of the Flying Scotsman, of being able to break that 100 miles per hour speed limit and being able to travel from London to Edinburgh. World War II was very similar to World War I. However, during this uh, period, the site was able to produce anti-aircraft um, and anti-warship weapons. They also built trains for the war. They continued with the munitions and they also built the horse gliders that were needed for World War II. And actually now, modern day, there is an aspect of continuity, continuity actually, even though only about a third of the previous site remains. We know that it is now, the business is known as Wabtec, and they do continue to repair and overhaul trains. They also develop solutions for railway transportation in the modern era. Um, so, in summary, don't forget, inextricably linked to the wider historical context of Britain.